Oceans. Our oceans need super sharks. We need them, and they need our help. Assemble the super sharks and help them save our seas. Okay, everybody, it is nearly six o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started here in a couple of minutes. We're going to wait and see if anybody else wants to join, so I'll go ahead and restart those videos for any newcomers we have present. Sharks and rays, they are ancient, enigmatic, misunderstood, and essential to our oceans. But these important animals are under immense pressure. As the Save Our Seas Foundation, we're here to help. Through supporting research, conservation, and education, we work to ensure a future for sharks and rays. The Save Our Seas Foundation. Together, we can make a difference. There are legends of the deep. Ancient and elusive, they are the keepers of balance in our oceans. support the oceans our oceans need super sharks we need them and they need our help Assemble the super sharks and help them save our seas.
Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. So welcome to our 10th and final Save Our Seas talk for this year. We are so glad to have all of you here joining us. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is actually not Lance, my name is Gabby, and I am the Environmental Sustainability Assistant Manager here at the Museum of Discovery and Science down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So um, uh, we are a nonprofit based out of Fort Lauderdale, and um, sorry, I wanted to share something with all of y'all. Perfect. So here is the museum outside. And so we have one very important mission here at the museum, and that is connecting people to inspiring science, which the Save Our Seas Foundation allows us to do through this wonderful talk. Um, so please, like I said, if you're ever around here, come on and visit us. We'd be more than happy to have you. So tonight, we are going to welcome Dr. Melissa Cronin. Um, Dr. Cronin is a Smith Conservation Research Fellow and a postdoctoral researcher um, at the Coast and Commons Collaboratory at Duke University, and she's working in partnership with the Global Fishing Watch and Conservation International. She received her PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UC Santa Cruz. Dr. Cronin's research lies at the intersection of conservation and fishery science. Her research focus is on fisheries bycatch, or the collateral damage that happens when big nets are used to catch fish. Personally, I'm interested in finding ways to make fisheries as sustainable as possible for species, for ecosystems, and for the people who rely on them. Dr. Cronin's journey in a marine science started with her spending much of her childhood on a tiny island off the wind-battered coast of Maine, surrounded by a working and vibrant lobster fishery. It was here on this tiny island, population 400, that she learned to fish with a mackerel jig and cook the perfect lobster. Mm. Fishing wasn't just a hobby, it was a livelihood, and it quickly became the focus of the rest of her career. Dr. Cronin uses interdisciplinary methods in the natural and social sciences with a special focus on applied research with real world conservation implications. Her PhD research focused on oceanic sharks and rays and employed genomics, policy analysis and collaborative social science methods to investigate the impact of industrial fishing on sharks and mobula, which are manta and de devil rays. Dr. Cronin is the co-founder and project leader of Mobula Conservation Project, an organization Woo! <laughs> dedicated to the research and conservation of manta and devil rays in the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Dr. Cronin also strives to merge science communication with all of her work. She is a successful environmental journalist covering wildlife, climate, and politics. You can find Dr. Cronin's writing in Slate, The New York Times, Grist, Salon, Vice, Orion Magazine, Popular Science, and The Nation. She is also a National Geographic Explorer, a Switzer Foundation Fellow, and a PEO Scholar. Dr. Cronin continues to write for the popular media in an effort to demystify conservation science and to promote public support for conservation to protect the world's threatened elasmobranchs. Wow, that's just amazing. Wonderful. Um, so throughout the conversation tonight, please, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, you know, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, Dr. Cronin, I'll, I'll take it, give it up to you. Great, thank you, Gabby. That was such a comprehensive biography. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing all of that. And thank you so much for having me. Um, oh, you know what? I've already shared the wrong screen. They give you all these awards, but they don't tell you how to share your screen correctly. Um, I'm just going to get into my presenter mode. I hope that looks okay. And while I do this, I like to just play some gratuitous uh, Devil Ray video. 
So yeah, as Gabby said, my name is Melissa Cronin. I received my PhD actually pretty recently from uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'm really thrilled to be here with you all tonight to talk to you about some of my work and the work of some of my colleagues um, that looks at focusing on manta rays, devil rays, and fishing. And as you will find out, this is a very complex, uh, often fishy, tangled up um, problem, which we will get into. But a bit about me, as, as uh, Gabby mentioned, I grew up spending a lot of time on the main coast, um, a very, very small island called Bailey Island, where there is a really important working um, lobster fishery. This is me taking a, a, a little jaunt on a friend's boat. Um, and this was really, really formative experience for me. You know, the introduction to a fishery that is, um, you know, functioning the way that we think uh, fisheries should function, but is actually quite complex. It's an inner, uh, a social and an ecological interdisciplinary um, system. And so I was really interested in this from, from a young age. Also, as Gabby mentioned, I, you know, my my path to my career now it has not been linear at all. And I say that in the hopes that there are um, folks in, on this call that are interested in getting into conservation um, work or conservation research to know that, you know, you really don't have to have a straight path. So I got a journalism degree in my undergraduate and I started working in New York, um, covering lots of different issues, but really focusing on uh, conservation, wildlife, and science. From there, I really wanted to go deeper, and I uh, did my PhD at the Conservation Action Lab at UC Santa Cruz under um, the advisement of Don Kroll, who's a really wonderful scientist. I'm going to talk about a lot about my work today, but I really, really want to emphasize the in incredibly collaborative nature of all of these studies and just sort of give credit where credit is very, very due to these four scientists, Marta Palacios, Nerea Lasamo Ochoa, Don, and Kelly Ziliakis, all of whom are incredibly involved in all of this work. Um, and I'll tell you more how so later. Before I get into that, I want to introduce you, hopefully in many cases, reintroduce you to this incredible species group um, together referred to as mobulids. If we were in person, I would have you all repeat that word several times because I really wanna normalize this idea that manta rays, we th that we think of manta rays, there's actually nine species that are very, very similar to manta rays. Um, often they're referred to as devil rays, but really, if you want to be correct, and if you really want to impress a marine biologist, um, throw around the word mobulid and, and get used to it because it's a more accurate and more inclusive word for this group of amazing species. A couple of quick fun facts about these species. So some of them are very small, as you can see here, this is a small um, species, but the largest, the giant oceanic manta ray can reach the um, width wingtip to wingtip that a giraffe is tall. That's about 21 feet across. Very, very, very large. Um, they can also uh, reach the weight equivalent to a Honda Civic. So these can get very big. Um, they have a long pregnancy, longer than humans at 12 months. They live long, you know, up to 30 years. It's a pretty long lifespan for a fish. And importantly, and this will come up later, they have very low reproduction about just one pup, one offspring every one to three years. So you know, this is not like a typical fish. This is much more like something like a dolphin or, uh, you know, an animal that we think of as relatively slow growing. Uh, Dr. Cronin, I have a question. Yeah, sure. So um, you said that they are able, that they're pregnant for 12 months, but yeah. um, are they, are, what, how do they give birth? Are they oviviviparous? Are they... Yep. Yes, they wow. have a live birth. Um, it is so rare that we have not observed a live birth in these species. And I believe all of the species, because it's very uncommon to observe, but we know that they're ovoviviparous. So they're giving live birth. The really cool thing is that they come out wrapped up in like a burrito shape. Um, and then they sort of just <laughs> sink pretty quickly, but then they sort of get their, their sea wings as so to speak. Um, they have really amazing, you know, this really cool life history. Um, and then there's no really, as far as we can tell, there's very little maternal care they're sort of on their own. But a yeah. colleague of mine, actually, Marta, who I mentioned earlier, has identified the first um, nursery area for this species that I'm showing here. And I'll just show this video, gratuitous video, as I explain this. She identified actually the first um, nursery area, which was in, uh, in um, Baja, California, in Mexico. 
And so it seems that they actually school when they're very young with individuals that are around the same size, I mean, about the same age, which is kind of cool. I like that idea of a, a school of really small uh, neonates or babies. Um, yeah, great question. So, so interesting, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of that um, that species, so this is uh, just to give you sort of a sense of the different types of mobulids. This is the very one of the smallest species, the monk's devil ray, and as you can see, this is making this huge school of probably hundreds, several hundred of individuals. You can't even see, but this is a very deep, generally very deep school. We actually don't know why they do this behavior, though we have a couple of theories. You can see they're actually jumping here. We don't know exactly why they're doing this jumping behavior, um, but it's really amazing. And I think a very, you know, little known, um, amazing sort of natural phenomenon. Also, they are filter feeders. So if you've ever seen a blue whale or another baleen whale filter feeding krill out of the water, they use the same exact uh, strategy for foraging or for eating. And I love this video here because you can really see the unrolling of what's called their cephalic lobes, these big sort of fleshy arms almost at the front, which help to filter in water that will soon be filtered by their gill plates. You can see those as the animal opens its mouth here. Um, so they have a really cool sort of unique uh, behavior and unique characteristics, especially compared to other sharks. You know, we think of these animals as predators, but these are very uh, simple predators, gentle predators, you might say. These animals are found globally. The species have different distributions, but here in yellow, you can see that they're found really all over the world. And this blue represents sort of um, ephemeral or, or uh, not permanent distribution, but really they're found everywhere. I have um, another question. Sure. This is coming from uh, the chat from uh, uh, Rachel B. Um, and they want to know, one, how high can they jump? And two, how big are their mouths? Which is such an interesting question. Yeah, that's a great question. So the jump, you know, I we've never measured it. It'd be a great, <laughs> fun thing to measure, but it's really high. I mean, you look and yeah. they're going... If you're at a boat, they're going sort of above like eye level. So it's pretty incredible. And the way they get them enough speed is that they come from pretty deep under the water and shoot up sort of like a whale breaching yeah. or whale jumping. Um, so they go pretty high. We don't have a great measure, but next time we're in the field, I'll make sure to try to do that. <laughs> I'm not sure how we would. And um, the sec what was the second question? How big are their mouths? Oh, you know, they're just about the size of like their body cavity. So they're pretty large. I mean, it depends on the species. Like for example, that the monk's devil ray that I showed you, they're about give or take like three feet across, four feet across. Um, I don't know in feet, but um, they're pretty small, but they're very, qu they're quite heavy actually. You pick them up and you know, sort of struggle. Whereas, you know, a giant manta ray, one of the largest individuals can be several, several feet across more than six feet, you know, just the body cavity, not the wings. So um, they, it really varies, but they can get huge. Okay, perfect. And then um, do they, do they don't eat, do they eat fish? They eat some small fish and some okay. species do more so than others, but the main diet is like plankton, like, um, plankton like diet where some of them have different specialized diets on different species of like krill type of things plankton -y, um zooplankton really so it's like a tiny little animal okay. but some of them do eat very small fishes okay is it possible to quantify how much they eat or would that depend yeah yeah like what proportion of their diet is from fish oh okay mm -hmm. um yeah I mean there have been diet studies so the way you do that is this a uh, method called stable isotope analysis. Ooh. And it's been done for lots of different, um, lots of different species, uh, mobulid species. People have also just looked at their gut content. So what's in oh. their stomach just then. And I know for a lot of species, they just find a lot of zooplankton, a lot of right. zoo, um, plankton, but yeah, they, they've done like lots of great studies on, you know, what they're actually eating, which is really cool to see. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, and, and that's a great uh, lead in to what I'll talk about next, which is, okay, we know what they're eating, what's eating them or what's targeting them. Unfortunately, the main predator for mobulids is we humans. So we've known for, for more than a century that mobulids, manta and devil rays are targeted by fishers. 
Here you can see some historic photos, including a photo, I'm sorry to say this happened in Florida, but of our former president, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt, who harpooned a giant, uh, an oceanic manta ray um, ages ago, about a hundred years ago. More recently, they are fished for both their meat, um, for local subsistence uh, consumption, as well as for sort of markets. They're also fished, unfortunately, for their uh, gill plates, which in some contexts, uh, particularly in many Asian countries, are, are very, very valuable. And they're used for a sort of um, pseudo medicine. Um, it's called traditional medicine, but actually there's evidence that this is really not a traditional practice. Um, and unfortunately, they're very, very valuable. This is not something I study, but I'm definitely happy to point folks in the in this direction for some good resources to learn more about this trade. It's a real problem for many of the species, especially those in um, Asia. What I do study and what I do know a little more about is this concept here. So if you think about fishing, you know, we're often looking for some type of valuable fish, right? Maybe a tuna, maybe a cod, whatever it is. But in the process of fishing, what often happens is that other animals get caught in the net, what we call gear. Other animals get caught in the gear. These animals are often referred to as bycatch. This might be sea turtles, this might be dolphins, this might be sharks. Um, but this is a big problem, especially as I already told you, these animals have very slow growth. They have few babies. They have life histories or characteristics that are much more similar to humans or to dolphins. So this bycatch can be a big problem. I mentioned already that, the, that they are impacted by both of these problems. So the direct fishing and the bycatch. Again, I'm just going to talk mostly about this bycatch issue and about the work that I'm doing around it. But as a result of these threats, um, all of the mobulids, all of the nine species are considered threatened by the IUCN red list, which is basically sort of the gold standard of um, categorizing species based on their threat level. So if you think of endangered species, in most cases, you're thinking of the IUCN red list. They're also restricted by a, a trade regulation, a global trade regulation. So there's a lot of interest in their conservation because we've seen global declines in many of their populations. And, oops, excuse me, the context that I study these animals in and this, this sort of problem is in the global industrial tuna fishing fleet. The reason that I study them is that you can see here in this, um, this slide, this uh, top map is showing the global distribution of tunas, okay? Where are tunas found? Obviously, very tropical and subtropical. Of course, you can see from this lower map that the mobilid global distribution overlays, unfortunately, very nicely with the global distribution of tunas, meaning that they're liable to get caught in these fisheries. And if you've ever purchased a, a can of tuna or a sushi or sashimi tuna, you're part of this issue. <laughs> so it's really good to be aware of it. Um, you can see from this, this figure that which shows that the global landings or global catch of tuna over the last half century this catch, this industry of tuna fishing has increased about a thousand percent over the last 60 years. It's a really big industry. Um, and the way that most of that tuna is caught is by a, this type of fishing method, which is called a purse seine. Purse seine is essentially what it sounds like, a very, very large purse shaped net that cinches at the top, kind of like a coin purse and is pulled in that, that uh, brings the, the tuna and whatever else is in there closer to the vessel so it can be um, processed. So as I said, this is about how, how we capture more than half of the world's tuna. These vessels cover an area that is 91% of the ocean surface. So it's very, very large scale. And just to give you a sense for what that actually looks like, um, this is a, a sort of a condensed version because they're so large that you really can't actually fit them in a drone video. But this is sort of a sense of what it looks like. So here they're scooping up the tuna from the purse onto the vessel deck. It's really a large, large process of industrial fishing. And unfortunately, about we estimate that about 13,000 mobulids are caught annually in these purse The work that I do with my collaborators is focused on the Eastern Tropical Pacific. This is a global mobulid biodiversity hotspot. We have five of the nine species occurring here. And we estimate that about 3,000 individuals are caught in these tuna purse every year. 
I'm going to just really quickly share you sort of what my research is about, or really the, the research of the team that I work with is about, um, and just two parts of it. And then I'll sort of tell you about, um, you know, the broader ecosystem of where this research fits. But the first uh, project I'll tell you about is trying to look at genetic diversity in mobiles. I'll tell you why that's important. I know it sounds a little bit jargony, but it really is very important. And the second project is, you know, what can we do to protect them? And I'll tell you about things that I think you all can do to, to join in that. But first I'll talk about this genetic research, which is really, really important. What I wanted to know, and this was during my PhD, was uh, how genetically diverse are these species? And that's a really, really important metric because we need to know what sort of genetic diversity is in a population in order to conserve it. We also need to know if diversity is low, that can be a real problem. Um, genetic diversity, we know based on decades of research, is really important for maintaining healthy populations. You've, if you've ever seen like a white tiger that's inbred, that's a, a great example of a population with terribly low genetic diversity. It's a very, very big problem. So we want to assess genetic diversity in these populations to understand, relatively speaking, how healthy they are. I won't go too deep into these like methodological details, but what you need to know is that I worked actually with fishers to collect bycatch samples from their from the animals that they catch on board these tuna uh, vessels. I also visited some fisheries to collect tissue samples, the little pieces of skin, usually from the tail, actually a little tiny piece of tail from many sites in the Eastern Pacific. And then we use these comparison groups on the other sort of side of the world. And this is really important because this work was funded pretty much solely by the Save Our Seas Foundation. So um, mm -hmm. total attribution to SOSF. They have been incredible. And really this work is because of the foundation. So it's great. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Cronin, just a question that popped into my head. Sure. Um, when you, you said, okay, so you said that you took a piece of tissue from the ends of their tail. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, did you do that? Did you do like a punch biopsy or? No, if you see, so if you, I wish I could zoom in on this, but right here, it's, uh, this is a, somebody on board, one of the tuna vessels, a technician that I trained, and he's actually taking a little uh, tiny dissection scissors and cutting off the very, very tip of the tail. Um, okay. you no, know, it's a really small, it's about a centimeter long. And the tail is cartilaginous. So we think it's like relatively a very pretty non-invasive process. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's crazy that from just that, we can like really unlock an entire genome. <laughs> right, absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, somebody in the chat wanted to know if um, these rays have barbs. That's a great question. So <laughs> except for one species, no, there is oh. no barb at all, total gentle giants. There is one species of spine tail mobulid, of course it's called that, that has, it's called vestigial, meaning it's like an evolutionary, like they don't need it anymore. It's just like a callback to earlier evolutionary days and it has a vestigial barb. So, uh, you know, the fishers will tell us that they're like careful around that species. It's right. not easy to get like nicked by it, but it is like not a great thing to, you know, to touch. Um, but no, I generally like they're very gentle animals and not dangerous at all um, in terms of like being around them. And in fact, many of them, especially the larger ones are pretty curious around divers. Oh, they're kind of cool. Gentle. Awesome. Giant. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, good questions. I love these. So just really quickly, I'm just going to give you a sense for like what we found in this study. Again, we were asking how diverse are they? Are, are they, and these are the two options for, for this answer, is there no diversity here on the left? Meaning all these populations are exactly the same. Everyone's just mixing around. Everyone looks the same. That would mean there's like no differences between the populations. Or are they more like this, where we see these like regional differences? You know, you might think of it as like, regional tribes, you have your Northern and your Central and your Southern. And I'll give you sort of the answer, which is we're finding more evidence. It's, it's weak, but we're finding more evidence for this type of a structure where there are actual genetic differences between populations at each of these sites. That is really, really important to know and relevant because it means that we, if we want to protect this species, we actually have to think about protecting each of these populations, you know, individually. We can't just sort of blanket protect, protect them. 
Also, we know that unsustainable fisheries, which these animals are subject to, reduces this gen genetic diversity. And so what I'm you know, concluding from this study is that we really need to reduce bycatch to actually preserve this genetic diversity. Okay, so we know we need to reduce bycatch. We know it's a priority given these, this evidence. How do we actually do that? The next project I'm gonna tell you about is how we can work with fishers collaboratively to actually protect mobilids from bycatch in these tuna fisheries. And I'm gonna first show you a little video that's, uh, I don't wanna do the audio, it's a little loud. That shows you like what it actually looks like when one of these mobulates is captured on board a Persane vessel. So here you can see a couple crew members. There's tuna all in the vessel, and they're actually using this sort of cargo net to release this animal off the vessel deck. And here in this video, you'll see that the animal actually swims away pretty, pretty lively, pretty happy after its release, suggesting maybe this animal survived. But we don't really know exactly the rate of survival after these types of captures, you know, whether they live or whether they die. And we don't know how yet to increase that chance, you know, to do really good handling methods, really good release methods that might uh, increase that chance. At the same time, some really good modeling work, some very quantitative work, has indicated that if we can actually increase the chance of survival after this process, we can really help the species overall. So we already know, like, this is something to look at. And then at the same time, there's decades of evidence that shows that the bycatch mitigation, so things that we do to intervene with bycatch that is informed by fishers actually is much more effective. So we have an incentive to you know, approach fishers to have them help us develop some of this technology. So what I did for this study, again, this was during my PhD, I surveyed stakeholders from the Ecuadorian Persane, tuna Persane fleet um, I surveyed people like skippers who are in charge of the vessel, crew, mechanics, observers, basically anybody who had experience with this type of bycatch. And I also held focus groups um, with fishers. Something really cool that came out of this work was that we found that really relatively minor operational modifications, so changes in the way you're fishing, can really help drastically improve survival. Um, so you can see a couple of the examples of sort of better handling processes. Here is a what we call a manta stretcher. Um, over here is this hydraulic winch being used to actually release the animal you know, without crew. Again, as I said, they can be very, very, very heavy. So having something that does that for you can be great. And then this last really interesting design, which was, um, which was devised by fishers, you know, without actually any prompting from us, the scientists. And this works kind of like a pasta colander where it actually catches the manta before it hits the vessel deck. You can imagine, you know, a pasta colander, a strainer, all of the water goes through. In this case, all of the tuna goes through, but the manta is caught. And that means it can be released very, very quickly off the vessel deck, um, rather than sitting on the deck and waiting for what might be too long. This is very cool because it led to the development of this new project that I'm working on in collaboration with some um, wonderful groups, including the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation and Azti Technalia in Spain. And what we're doing is actually testing a very similar device to what the fishers um, introduced. So here you can see, it'll become more clear in a moment, but here you can see a steel grid that is actually sitting over a hole in the vessel deck. That grid is designed to, again, work just like a pasta colander or a strainer, where it catches the mobulids before they fall into an area where it's very difficult to get them out of. In this case, you'll see that actually three individuals were caught at the same time, um, which happens actually regularly, more often than you think. Um, and what they're gonna do is actually use the hydraulic machine that's already on the vessel. You know, They have lots of technology already on the vessel to remove these animals really quickly. The very important thing about this is that mobulids, um, like many other uh, species, are what's called obligate ram ventilators. That's a very jargony term to say, to mean that they must pass water across their gills constantly to breathe. You, you might think of uh, sharks that need to constantly swim to stay alive. They are very, the exact same um, behavior. And so, the, the longer the animal is on the vessel deck, the more likely it's going to die. You know, it's not like a turtle that can just kind of hang out for a little bit because it's breathing air. 
So this type of technique that gets the animals off the vessel deck really, really quickly is potentially, you know, a game changer in terms of likelihood of survival. And I'll say like this video is just a couple minutes, three minutes long um, compared to, you know, 20, 30, 40 an hour on the vessel deck, which oh, can wow. be the norm in many situations. And Dr. Cronin, um, so obviously when they get on the boat and they're no longer able to be in the water and breathe, um, obviously it's really bad for them, but I was also wondering um, if rising to the surface has any negative effect on them at all, because from my understanding, these nets can be quite deep, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, very deep. I mean, like hundreds of meters, but the interesting thing about mobulids in contrast to something like a dolphin is that they mm -hmm. actually dive when they're captured in a net like this. Um, oh. So often you know, a dolphin will stay at the surface because it has to breathe air, which means that there are things you can do on the surface. Like you spot them, you say, okay, let's move the net around so they can get out. Mobulids make it very difficult for us to release them because they dive and often you know, they can dive and swim or they can dive directly into the net. So it's a, it's like a dangerous behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and it just makes mitigation really difficult because you might not even know in many cases, the fishers I interviewed didn't even know there was a mobulate in their, in their net until it comes up. So it's really tricky. People have tried things like cutting the net, um, or other types of methods, but it's just a hard there are difficult species to actually even observe before they get on the deck. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Yeah. So another thing we did with this group of fishers was to try to implement some of the recommendations that they gave us for good handling and some regulations that they're actually required to adhere to by creating these really nice, I think they're really beautiful um, and useful posters that we have translated into lots of different languages um, adapted to the Atlantic, the Western Pacific, the Eastern Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. And we've actually put them on these really large tuna vessels. So you can't tell, but this is from a 300 ton tuna vessel, um, the hallway. And this is great because not only can fishers, you know, understand or be reminded of what is a proper release, what is an improper release, um, but they can also practice their identification skills, which is really difficult for some of these species that look like each other. And we want to help improve that so we get better data back. So this is sort of a multi, multi-fold um, poster approach. If you're interested in printing out one of these posters, having one for yourself, they're all available at this link at my uh, organization, Mobula Conservation, in lots of languages. Okay, that sort of concludes the work I'm going to tell you about today. I just wanted to mention the other work that's going on in my sort of sphere of collaboration, particularly led by Marta and Nerea and myself at Mobila Conservation, as well as by our students, Jenny and Izzy, who are doing incredible work um, as students. We're also working on some policy and governance intervention, working at this really large international body level. We're working on habitat models for mobulids. We are actually going into schools, especially in Baja California, to work with uh, local youth so that they can be educated about the mobulids that are just in their backyard. Um, one student of mine, Jenny, is leading a study with uh, helicopter pilots who are actually on board these huge vessels. They use helicopters to find uh, tuna, trying to see if we can use them to actually also identify and potentially avoid mobulids before they set down their net. And then finally, Izzy, a student of mine, is leading a seafood mislabeling project to try to understand whether mobulids are being sold in grocery stores under um, inappropriate or um, incorrect names. So that's kind of the research stuff. I wanted to share a couple like sort of fun things about working with mobulids. The first, and this is a video. Um, the first is like how we work with drones. Um, we've been using the drone drones the past couple of years. And this is unfortunately me flying a drone and my colleague about to catch the drone. I'll tell you, this is perhaps the most stressful moment of my entire life. <laughs> he did great. And then you can hear a scream. I don't know who that was. It wasn't me, Shirley. <laughs> but a lot of like the work of a conservation biologist involves like these odd technical skills, flying a drone. Um, I'll, I'll show you more on this the next slide, but it's just sort of a fun thing that we do, but also terrible. Um, other things, you know, what's it like to work with mobiids? I often get this question, you know, it's incredible, frankly, like seeing these animals in the wild is, is breathtaking. 
Um, it's very humbling. You know, they are just really, truly living a life that we have no idea about. Um, and it's really an incredible part of my work. We really have high fashion. We pride ourselves on our, our great fashion as field biologists. That's facetious, obviously. And again, stress. Uh, this is a good um, example of the type of stress that genetic work induces. So you can see this is a vial, a very small vial. In the bottom, you can barely see it, but there is a little lip of liquid. And in that is 82 manta ray genomes um, that I was using for my, for my analyses. If you drop that vial, it's done. It's over. Your entire study is over. That's like, that's like months and months and months worth months of and months. data and collection exactly. and manta rays. I mean, they're raising. Exactly. You have to... And even if the male, like we mail them, if the male loses it, oh, don't even wow. get me started. A lot of stress, a lot of oh mishaps. A lot of the work in the field involves, you know, learning to roll with the punches. Um, like PhD, I learned how to change a tire because we had a um, unfortunate event with a tire in Baja, but it's a lot of fun and it's certainly um, an ever-changing experience. Finally, I just want to wrap up with some ideas about how you can help protect mobulids. Um, like I said, you know, these species are really, um, they're very endangered and they are highly threatened by many different threats, including this fisheries bycatch, but other, other threats as well. The first thing you can do is really just learn more about them, get involved, you know, make the word mobulid part of your vocabulary. A great place to learn about them is at our website again at mobulidconservation.org. You can also follow us. We have a really incredible Instagram um, that has really great facts and beautiful videos, images of mobulids and of our field work. Um, and as well as on Facebook, you can support our work. You know, as I said, like a lot of this work is time consuming and difficult and can be expensive. So if, if it's within your capacity, that's great. Um, if folks out there are students, you know, get involved with marine research, um, whether it's mobilids or whether it's another, you know, similar species or even ecosystem research, there's so much going on and a lot of, um, researchers and especially a lot of grad students often need uh, assistance. So if you can get involved with research, it's a great way to you know, dip your toe, see if you like it and, and get involved with this type of work. I often get the question, you know, what seafood should I eat? And um, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about how I, how I think about this issue, but I think um, you know, there's lots of ways to participate in sustainability. If you eat fish, if eating fish aligns with your moral values, a great thing to do is to seek and ask for local and sustainable seafood. One good resource for that is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. You can get the phone app, you can get a wallet card, or just go online, look at the type of food that, uh, or excuse me, the type of seafood that you're thinking about purchasing. Another good resource is from uh, Greenpeace. They, they publish every couple of years, they publish a tuna scorecard. So you can look, you know, how does my bumblebee tuna uh, compare and, and really what's involved with the production of the food I'm going to eat. But I'd say a, a good rule of thumb is knowing exactly where your seafood came from. And if you can make it local is generally a, the best bet because you can at least like have access to that knowledge. I think perhaps more importantly than sort of our own consumption is getting engaged in fishery management and demanding better fishery management for tuna and for other species um, and better governance. And a couple of great resources to sort of start that journey are Sharks, Shark Advocates International. This is an incredible organization that is extremely involved in policy, um, both at the national and international levels. They have these action alerts that are really great. So if something big is coming up like a big bill or, or a big action is coming up, you can be the first to know and really get engaged, write letters to your Congress people, um, you know, do see, sort of these political actions that might have a, a greater effect than even your own consumption. Um, and then the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. This is like a one-stop shop for everything you need to know about tuna sustainability, and you can really get engaged there as well. Perfect. And just for all of these of you watching at home, if you are local to the Fort Lauderdale area and if you are ever at the museum, uh, we do actually have uh, the Seafood Watch guides already printed, cut out, wallet size. So you can just come visit our shark cart, pick one up, and then you can uh, educate yourself further about a more sustainable way to eat fish. 
That's great. A better, another reason to visit you. <laughs> Awesome. And yeah, I'd just like to wrap up with some educational resources. If you are a student, this is generally geared towards, um, you know, grade school level. But if you're a student or an instructor, these are excellent resources, whole lesson plans around mobulids and mantas and, and their threats and their incredible characteristics. And these are all found at education.mantatrust.org. Uh, again, Manta Trust is a really incredible organization that I would check out for sure if you're interested in more information about mobilids and how to protect them. Finally, I'd love to thank particularly Save Our Seeds Foundation. As I said, they have really made this work possible. It truly would not have been possible at all without their support. Um, I would love to thank Lance and Gabby and Samantha for hosting me and you all for coming. And I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Amazing. That was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, what an interesting topic and what interesting research. Uh, that was really just an all around wonderful presentation. So thank you so much for coming on here and speaking to us tonight. Uh, that being said, we'll now start the Q&A portion of the talk. So if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat, or um, if we all go one at a time, we can unmute ourselves, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, while people kind of gather their questions together, I'm going to go ahead and just read a few from the chat. Um, the first one that I saw was um, if they can they communicate and if so how yeah that's such a good question i'll say i'm not a behavioral scientist so i'm not the expert in communication what i will say from my experience working um with my collaborator collaborator marta in baja um is that the species that we work with amongst double ray jumps out of the water and the result of that jump and sort of like the concave shape of the mobulid is a really loud slap on the surface of the water. And you can imagine if you're actually under the water, that slap is even louder. Oh yeah. Um, we don't know that we really do not know. So <laughs> everything I'm saying is hypothetical. We don't know why they jump. There is like no peer reviewed science that says here's why they jump. One hypothesis is that it could be a way to signal to other individuals to gather close. And that gathering might be to avoid predators. We know that their predators are killer whales, orcas in this region, um, as well as maybe some sharks. But uh, it might be that that slapping noise is actually like a form of communication. Hey, come over here, let's get together, let's be closer. It might be something else. It might be, you know, some sort of mating signal. Um, but again, we really don't know. It's a, it's such a great mystery. So if anyone's interested in doing like a, a master's or a PhD, it's a really good uh, behavioral ecology question that I would love someone to answer for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, would anybody, does anybody else have a question that they want to speak up or should I just keep, uh, you know, going off of what's going off in the chat? Okay, um, so if anybody wants to jump in at any point, please feel free. Um, so I somebody asked in the chat if eating tuna was bad, and we just kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a really good question, and it's um, I think the answer is like such a complex one. Unfortunately, there's a couple like levels. So you know, for some people eating an animal is not aligned with their moral values. And that is like very respect, respectable. You know, I really respect that approach to sort of like being a moral human being. For other people, they want to, uh, you know, eat some type of animal product and they also want to, um, you know, protect mobulids or, or whatever support sustainable fisheries. And so they decide to, um, to eat fish. I find that that question can be really distracting from the real issues, which are, you know, we actually need better fishery management and better conservation. Um, and I, I think it's really, really important to like vote with your dollar and make sure that you're consuming um, in a way that reflects your moral values and, and what you feel is right. 
Um, especially because we know, especially this industry, there are so many other problems beside, besides mobility bycatch, including human rights abuses, um, including labor problems. Like there's a lot of other issues here. So I'd say, you know, a, a great way to like, there's, it's great to be a good consumer, a responsible consumer, but we really need more than that. It's like both. And I would say, if you do want to eat tuna and you're looking for an option that is like the least um, impactful, a really good option is pole and line tuna. That's P O L E and line tuna, meaning it's more like an actual fishing rod, you know, that you think of in like a cartoon, uh, and not a big per seine, um, net. And that's generally much more sustainable because it's more selective. So it's not catching other things. It's catching what it intends to catch, right. which is tuna. And you can find that in most markets now. Um, so yeah, it's just to say that, um, I don't want to be the moral arbiter of anything, but I think there's lots of ways to contribute to, uh, to like ocean sustainability. And one, the most important to me is really getting engaged politically, getting better regulations because the tuna industry right now is not going away. Um, so we need real, real serious improvements, but it's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question and a wonderful response. Um, from the chat, we have a question from Jessica, who wants to know if there are any plans to study post-release mortality in the per seine fishery, maybe with satellite tags. Yes, I love it. That's such a great question because we are indeed, in fact, in a couple of weeks, I think uh, we're going to be doing exactly that um, with a, a tuna per seine fishery. And we're actually using satellite tags. So what satellite tags do in this case is that we we put the tag on the animal, it swims off, and then we get notified via satellite ping whether or not the animal lives or dies. And that's really important because then we can say, okay, like either all of the animals that get caught are dying or not. Um, what we're doing with that post-release mortality study is actually trialing the, the grid that you saw in that video, the longer video, we're trialing that on a vessel. So we can say, okay, you know, post-release mortality for, for using this grid is perhaps better. You know, that's what we hope, but we need to test it or, or the same. There's studies ongoing that are led by um, Josh Stewart, who's uh, at Manta Trust and is a professor. And it looks like post-release mortality is really variable um, and depends on the species that's involved. So some of them have higher mortality, some have lower, and it might depend a lot on the method of handling. So it's exactly what we're hoping to investigate next. Wow, that is fascinating. I love that. Um, great question. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thank you to you, Dr. Cronin. We have another question from the chat. Um, they want to know, so we understand that these mobulids uh, jump and they jump out of the water, but do we know why? No, no. Yeah. Like I was saying, we don't know. And it's really mm -hmm. such an interesting behavior. Um, you know, people come from all over now. Tourism is really growing in that area based on mm -hmm. those species. And it's just really this one species, the monk's devil ray that does it with a lot of frequency. Other species will jump, but this species jumps like every day, uh, regularly. Um, we actually know, like we go out to look for them with my lab at UC Santa Cruz and, um, you know, we see them because they're jumping. So it's very predictable. And again, we don't know why they're doing it. We, we hypothesize it could have something to do again with predator avoidance. Maybe you want to group people together, but it, people have said, maybe it's about like sloughing off parasites. I don't know about that. It's a great, it's one of like, I think the best mysteries in ecology. So wow. and answer it. <laughs> That's amazing. If only we could just talk to these creatures, right? <laughs> I'm just, so why, do you know how amazing that would be? But I don't, I don't know if that would be uh, good for all the scientists and the biologists of the world. I, yeah, <laughs> careful what you wish for. A lot of laboratories would be empty maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I have a question for you, and that is if you had a wish list for this project, or if you were offered a blank check, what direction would you take this research project in? Yeah, that's such a good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it would depend on like the, the true blankness of the check. I would say, <laughs> um, I think a really, really important area of research that we haven't fully explored yet is how to actually avoid 
the animals in the first place. And, um, you know, like I said, post-release mortality is variable <clears throat> and we can do a lot of things that will improve the, the sustainability of the fishery. But if we, if we do everything and it still doesn't work for some species, well, then we're still not having success. And so I would, if I had a blank check, I would put all of my money into technology that actually avoids mobilids. And there are some ideas around that. Like um, the study that I mentioned about helicopter pilots, that's like a really useful potential, potentially useful um, avoidance technique. People are thinking about sonar, you know, these vessels use sonar to find fish. So why can't we just use it for mobilids? Right. Um, so I would do like a massive global study on avoidance. How can we not even touch them in the first place? Because that's our best bet if we really want to reduce or remove the impact of tuna fishing on these species. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly. And I mean, what a what an incredible thing that would be to do, because think about the broad application of that. I mean, if you could develop sonar to detect mobulids, theoretically speaking, you could also detect that make sonar to detect sea turtles, dolphins. Right. Wow, that would be really, really incredible. Yeah. Um, so anyone who's got a blank check, you let me know. <laughs> absolutely. If anybody here has a blank check, please let us know. <laughs> Um, so that being said, I also wanted to know what initially inspired your journey to begin re researching, uh, you know, mobile conservation, and if you have any advice for somebody who is wanting to follow in your footsteps. Yeah, absolutely. So I was really interested, like I said, you know, I grew up with great exposure to fishing, but it's not all um, rosy, like every fishery is complex and has, you know, things going on. So I was really interested in studying uh, problems that are associated with fishing that are sort of indirect, you know, not exactly overfishing, but like, what are the other problems associated with it? I was really lucky that my advisor during my PhD had an ongoing, a decades long ongoing project on this species, the, oh, the monk's devil ray in Mexico. But I was really interested in industrial fisheries. He's worked in a small scale fishery setting, more of a coastal small fishery. But I was really interested in industrial fisheries in what you would consider the more destructive fisheries. Um, and so actually just like sort of this opportunity came up with the commission that manages these fisheries um, to work in collaboration with them on that genetics project. And then we sort of expanded from there. So funny enough, genetics, which I was totally unqualified to for, um, really opened the door for all these other studies around mobilids and also other research and collaboration, which was great. Um, if I had to give advice, and I think hopefully my background is a great example of this, it's that conservation work, research, um, advocacy, you know, uh, any type of conservation work, it's not only for biologists, um, or certainly not only for geneticists. You know, there are lots of disciplines and lots of careers that are focused on conservation that are very different from biology. And it's really, really important that we have those people. Economics is a huge part of conservation, social science, um, you know, like the work I was doing with the fishermen, um, organizing. Uh, there are so, so many fields that should and do contribute to conservation. And I really encourage students to, you know, find the discipline that or the methodology that they like, but you can do conservation from any perspective. And, and like I said, it's really not linear. Obviously my, my career track was like all over the place. Um, but I think that was cool because it gave me a lot of unique skills. So if you're going one way and you want to do conservation, that's totally fine. Um, you know, it's just about positioning yourself to stand out and positioning your, your existing skills to, to benefit the work that you want to do. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's really, really great advice. And I mean, what an interesting journey you've had from, you know, the lobster fisheries of Maine all the way to, um, Baja, Mexico, which is just incredible. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat now. Um, in the meantime, in one of your first slides, you had a picture with Jane Goodall. Yeah. What, what was that like? That's my humble brag slide. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. That was when I was reporting and she was doing an event and it was really fortunate. And, you know, like it's just another good example. Like she's totally cool and lovely and super normal. I was just like chatting. Um, and I think it's like really easy for us to like put our idols on such a pedestal and she really deserves it. She's so incredible. Has done so much for conservation, but you know, she, she started her career some somewhere and, um, 
for folks who are like interested in this type of work, you know, you just start somewhere and you get deeper and deeper into this work. Um, but yeah, it was really, really cool. I was totally, um, fangirling. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, that is so wonderful. Um, just for anybody wondering, Jane Goodall is a conservation icon. I would put it as that. Um, she began her research with chimpanzees quite a long time ago, decades and decades ago. And ever since then, she's made a name for herself um, in the conservation world, in the biology world, just as an incredible uh, researcher and also activist. Um, and that is just so neat that you were able to meet her and converse with her um, and report on her because uh, personally for me, I mean, that's like, that's so cool. <laughs> it was cool. She does a lot of speaking engagements. So who knows? There's still, you know, you might meet her someday. <laughs> that would be so cool. That would just be, I mean, amazing. That would be so cool. Um, okay, so go ahead. If you have any last minute questions, get them in on the chat. Um, but what I wanted to ask also was, how can any person from the general public help with conserving mobulids or just ocean conservation in general? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the very first step is getting informed, getting, you know, a working knowledge of the problems that are facing our ocean. And there are lots of great resources. I saw that um, somebody put our website in the chat, which is great. I mean, even on our website, you can learn about, you know, industrial fisheries. You can also learn about the work we're doing in artisanal or small scale fisheries, which is another important source of um, mobilid catch and bycatch just getting informed. And then again, if you're, um, especially in this country, if you're interested in getting politically engaged in fishery management, a lot of people are not engaged <laughs> with fishery management bills or acts or regulations, but that's really where the rubber hits the road. Like that's where we get the rules that dictate what happens in our ocean. So I would follow, um, again, the links that I, that I can put in the chat, Shark Advocates International, and follow the bills that are happening in your in your vicinity or in your country, um, because a lot happens at a regional and local level that has to do with fishery management. And you can really do a lot by being an engaged constituent. Hey, that's amazing. You heard it here first, folks. Okay, we have a hand raise. Um, all right, uh, go ahead. What is your question? Yes. Hi. I just wanted to comment that um, we put in the chat, there's a link to sign a petition for anybody who is a registered voter in the state of Florida who happens to be on this chat. There is a link for the right to clean water, which is a movement to put the right to clean water in the Florida Constitution, which will then hold uh, corporations and uh, governing bodies accountable. And so if there are any registered voters in the state of Florida who would like to access that link in the chat. It's www.floridarighttocleanwater.org. And these are petitions. We are trying to generate enough petitions to get this put on the ballot. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, with that being said, questions going once, going twice. All right, everybody. Um, so thank you so very much for coming and joining us here today for our 10th and final Save Our Seas talk uh, for the year of 2022. Some of you have been here for all 10 talks and um, just everybody, thank you so much. We really appreciate y'all coming out here and um, learning about some of these amazing research projects with us. Um, again, I'd really like to thank the Save Our Seas Foundation for sponsoring such an incredible, incredible speaker series. And um, although we won't be having another speaker series in 22, please don't despair because we will get started in January and go right back to doing this and um, have an amazing 2023 with just more speakers and more information. So thank you, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Goodbye. <laughs> Everyone. Thanks, Dr.